I'm sure you'll agree a fantastic series of discussions and papers this morning that throw us directly into that challenge of uh, what our working world looks like now, uh, what it's clearly going to be in the very near future, and how we as um, a carbon-based life form, rather than a silicon-based one, uh, how we sort of find our way in it. So with that, we'll talk about innovation. And I will move over here. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm actually going to pick up, I think, j just to begin, in a way on a point um, that, Tim, you were making, and to make a confession that I am, I am a little prone to anxiety. <laughs> and uh, so when I hear uh, papers like I do this morning, it just sort of sets, sets my anxiety right off. And let me tell you why. Um, because I hear of, you know, um, machines and robots and IA that might be AI that might be moving into my um, workplace. I, I hear about what we're doing, but what we're not doing in terms of really getting a grip on uh, how our workplace might be changing and evolving. I hear about both the opportunity and, let's be frank, the threat from a place like China and what that means for our position in the world. I see our politics and I see that it's something close to broken. Um, I look at our schools and I see them, you know, s struggling, but perhaps not educating our kids in the way that we would hope them to, and, and if we can compare them with other um, societies and other countries around the world. And I frankly start to freak out that we are you nowhere... You shouldn't do that. Yeah. You shouldn't do that. <laughs> I almost that feel we, like I should we'll look after you. hold your hand. Well, I was hoping someone would. <laughs> the robot isn't going to. <laughs> A nice carbon-based platform here. Yes. Um, and so I guess my first question to you all is, um, uh, am I worrying too much? Can you reassure me? Hmm. Look. Oh, oh, are you going to go? No, you go. Okay. okay. Um, oh, look, I, I think you, we, we need to be uh, real and, and, and confront the challenges, which I think Tim pointed out. But I don't think we should be pessimistic or anxious. I think we have, uh, should have confidence that if we have open dialogue, good debate, that things will improve. I'm not saying they're all good now. Um, and yes, China has many complex relations. Uh, the impact of technology, you can't deny it, but it's what you do with it. And, and that's what we've got to step up. And so when Tim talks about us being involved in politics, let's use technology to participate and get involved and influence rather than being the victim. So I think there's very much we find this victim or victor mentality. You can either be the recipient and do nothing about it and say, woe is me, or step in and make a difference. And I think, Tim, aren't you saying we should step in and make yeah, and no, have an opinion? No, absolutely. But um, I'm, You're the first person I've heard at a conference recently that said join a political party. Right, I think yeah, if we're yeah. all drinking <laughs> yeah, coffee right. at that moment, we all would have done a spit take. He <laughs> 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 did say you could do a couple of other things. Yeah, there is was, lots one of ways to get involved <laughs> in politics yeah. without actually joining yeah. a political party, isn't there? I think what yes. Tim is telling yeah, yeah. us to do is to get active. Get active, and yeah. You know, we need much more honest conversation. I think that's the thing. Too much today, we will turn away from a difficult topic because we don't want to offend someone, we want to be politically correct. Yep. Um, and it was so liberating for me when I said, look, I'm an advocate for gender equity, I want it to be 50-50. I think it's really liberating what mm. Tim is challenging us to do and say about work. Data tells you to be optimistic as well, Virginia. So the oh, I love data. For the vast, you know, yeah, I'm not like sure it. I'm a carbon-based life form <laughs> yes. either. I've worked in Syrah for too long. They take it out and put all the machinery in. But um, <laughs> the data tells you to be optimistic in that for the vast majority of humans over the, all the world, things are getting better over time. The wind back option takes us to something worse. So the data tells us uh, towards an optimistic world. But picking up on David's point, um, you know, there is no wind back option and there's no unplug option for all this tech, right? AI is coming, sure. it's gonna be here. Yeah. So were we to sort of huddle and hide and hope it wasn't gonna happen, it will still happen. But the, the front footed approach, we've, we've got to dive in, we've got to make the transitions early. In, in the workforce, much easier to get a job when you've already got a job. So reskill now. You know, uh, stitch in time saves nine. This is the thing, though. I think a responsibility for policymakers and, and people that have a voice is to recognise there's a lot of data, but there's a huge lag in the data. Yeah. So when you think about what's happening with education, you know, our bias towards university, less emphasis on vocational training. Which does seem to be um, tipping it's a bit tipping. back now. I yeah. agree, it's yeah. tipping. But then what sort of skills are coming out? Sure. You know, there's only two masters of advanced analytics in the entire country at the moment. And that's a time lag that I don't think we can afford. Yeah. 
So I can understand why people are concerned about where their children are going to get their work from. And this is the challenge I get from people that I interact in West Farmers and AGL. They're not worried about themselves. They can yeah. see their pathway. The what about my children? They yeah. want the next generation to do better off. And I think that's what drives confidence. Sure, and, and let's talk about that path. Tim, I'll come to you in a second. I'm assuming that um, audio, sonic boom is some audio bleed from next door, correct? Is it a yeah. dance party that we're invited to later on? <laughs> it's a future of work. Yeah, I mean, it's a well, techno dance party. I, I, either you brought some fab new thing from Syrah that you Robot told us about that's sort of being coming. exploded <laughs> in the room next door. Um, Tim, what were you going to say on that? Um, I was, the, the point that I would make in addition to the points that I've made here, is that I would like the conversation to move away from technology and work. Yeah. We're always talking about how it's going to affect work, and we're even talking in terms of, you know, increasing, you know, getting rid of um, retirement and continuing working longer and working longer hours even during our normal working life. I think we really need to pull back from that a lot. Yeah. For, for a lot of people, work is a really fulfilling experience. It is the main thing that they do. Yeah. A lot of individual worth comes from that. But that's not true of everybody by any stretch of the imagination. There's plenty of reports around that show in the vicinity of 30 to 40 per cent of people think that the work that they do is a complete waste of time. Now, Tim, can I ask you, how do you define work? Because I think you're using a traditional definition of paid employment. Is that well, Well, actually, I talk about this a lot in both yeah. books, is that we need to rethink that whole notion of work because yeah, the whole right. yeah. um, paid employment, yeah. um, the, the formal economy, yeah. um, absolutely rests on the informal economy of Correct. unpaid work. Yes. Yes. And we need to better recognise yeah. that. Yeah. And to recognise that just because you aren't doing paid employment doesn't mean you're not valuably yeah. contributing to I society. Really this that. is a riff yeah. on your collaboration piece. Yes. Yeah. Because we see ourselves as individuals and we should see ourselves yes. as a team. A and at the biggest level, mm. Team Australia, where everyone makes a contribution, some do paid work, others do other stuff, doesn't oh, oh, Of course, but if this conversation goes on much longer, we'll all be accused of being socialists, and of course that's right. the worst thing you well, can be in this country yeah, apparently at the moment. At the moment. No, but, um, <laughs> no, no, no. But, but, but it's true, no, I mean, because what you're saying about unpaid work is yeah. absolutely indisputably true, yeah. but, but then everyone here in this room wants to, wants to go to the bank and find there's some money there as well. Absolutely. But I don't think they're diametrically opposed. I, I think that, you know, the, um, the economy is critically important, creating value, but value is created in many different ways. Yes, it's financial value. I don't see them contrary at all. You see, a, a healthy, vibrant society is good for business, you know, because unless we're healthy, unless we've got good social engagement, you know, big business isn't going to do well, small business but, is going to do well. But yeah. governments see it differently to that. Some. The well, hoops yes. that people have to jump yeah. through if they're temporarily unemployed to get the scummy true, amount true. of I, I, I doll payment that yeah. they get is, yeah. um, is enormous because the, the mindset is very specifically, if you're not working, you're not contributing. Yeah. And I think at that level, at least, yeah. government really needs to Have a to go to get a go, that. I yeah. hear. Have a go to get a go. It fits yeah, on yeah. a T-shirt. Um, <laughs> we do have some microphones in the room, don't we? Can I see, there's one down here and there's one here. Can I just get one of the organisers, see down there, there'll be a mobile phone just sitting next to you, Jennifer. If someone could just pop that up to me, because that's how I'm going to get access to my, mm -hmm. thanks so much, to my, the questions that are coming in from our um, live stream. Hello, live stream. Um, send your questions in to use the app and it'll be, they'll be sent to me. But if you have any questions, whack your hand up. Let me try and see who you are. Any, um, I've got one here, so it's got a microphone there, and then the second microphone there as, as well, so one and two. But before we get to those, we'll just um, dig on a, a bit further and then we'll come to you. Given the, um, the anxious scenario that I've outlined to you and your rather optimistic response then, do any of you or all of you feel that our workplaces right now actually have a good understanding, a good handle on what it is to be um, a contributing, sentient human in the workplace right now, all the capacities and capabilities that we have, and are our workplaces really making the most of those? Stefan? I think it's a lot better than it has been. Um, on many fronts, uh, workplace safety is in a completely different space, but uh, new risks are emerging. Anxiety and stress in the workforce, as we picked up in the study that we did with Safe Work Australia, is at higher levels than we've seen before. I wonder a bit about whether we're getting better at reporting it and managing it. You know, um, 
sort of mental health in the workplace when I started my career 20 years ago wasn't something we even talked about. And I don't think it didn't exist. It's just that we didn't have mechanisms for picking it up. Today, we're all trained on it and taught about it and we learn about how to manage it and what it is. So I wondered a bit whether stress and anxiety and mental health issues are on the rise or we're just getting better at reporting about it, but they're certainly out there. Overall, though, I think you've, you've got to be able to point to an incredible safety gains in Australia's workforce that have been remarkable. Well, all apart from safety, um, what, what's the best indicator that, that you see that um, work, the contemporary workplace in Australia really understands what it's got there in terms of its yeah. workforce and its potential and capabilities? Yeah, but you know, I, I was at a conference recently, a McKinsey conference on young leaders, and I was on the stage with Liz Broderick. And it was fascinating to me... Ms. Broderick is the former sex discrimination commissioner right. um, well, and the, the woman who put together the idea of the um, male champions of change yep. uh, and is a formidable speaker and thinker. And now an advisor to the United Nations mm. on things. And, and the, the, we talked about workplace culture and most of the questions, and this is from young leaders sort of 25 to 35, was about... We were talking about gender diversity, we were talking about inclusion, about safe workplaces, and most of it went to bringing your humanity to work. Yeah. It, that's where the conversation went, yeah. about these sort of hidden rules about how you behave in, at work and, and somehow leaving that humanity at the door as you walked in. It was a fascinating discussion and a really rich engagement about people wanting to care for people. And they, so maybe it was a certain yeah. generation, I don't know, but I found it really instructional. So I don't think we're there, but I think people are really wanting um, to have, you know, Yes, I, I, I think yeah. that's true. I've spoken yeah. to a lot of people in a lot of different businesses over the last couple of years, and what they're realising is a, a point Stefan made, which is that as technology can do more of the repetitive sort of tasks, what becomes important in workplaces are those so-called so soft skills. So, um, and I reckon it's actually changing how we work with each other. So yes. the traditional command and control organisational structure is hopefully pretty soon dead. You know, it hasn't served us very well. It is a killer for innovation and innovation. It, if you, we it, believe, it, it, and it's extraordinarily yeah. limiting, isn't it? Right. Just, I mean, know, the moment you're working in that environment, yeah. this person has me in a box like this, and that's right. it. You know. And if we believe Clayton Christensen, the U.S. academic at Harvard, who's written all these papers on innovation and what effectively allows firms to succeed and thrive, and ones that don't, innovation is his main answer, and that's you know that's what why Kodak didn't make it through 2012 without the right. bankruptcy right. and everything was its lack of innovative capability. So Good I think um, much more flat organisational structures, matrix, networked, where other, other words can be used. But I think one of the most significant cultural changes that is coming along with technology is a, is a loss of that command and control structure, uh, which hasn't done us too well and it, it won't work for the next 10 years, I don't think. And you speak to people running these big businesses like banks. I was with a, a banking conference recently. That sort of flat structure is being introduced more right. and more. Diana, a question's come through for you and it might actually be a way of um, leading you towards answering, this, answering my earlier question. Um, and this is from um, our digital delegates. Thank you. You mentioned good work design and using the hierarchy of controls. Can this be applied to the prevention of psychological harm at work? Yeah, I think it can, um, because when we talk about well-being, you know, we're not talking about just providing yoga opportunities or quiet spaces and so forth, but it's about thinking about the actual tasks that people have to do um, in their day and thinking how long does it really take to do them and how much time do people really need to spend at work? Mm. And while we still have structures that go, oh, well, it's a you know seven and a half or a seven hour day and everyone needs to come along and do five days worth of work to equally contribute, um, we're going to find that we can't Thanks, design Rachel. workplaces that are psychologically safe, that remove stress and barriers. So that's the piece about the work design. Then we come to the bit of how people interact with that system yep. and also to allow people to actually choose the type of work they want to do. And I think while I'm really optimistic and I see green shoots all over the place about the conversations we're having, we still have a lot of institutional anchors out the back. Superannuation is a really good one. You know, really the only way you can tax effectively save for a, a agent, you know, agency filled retirement 
is to be able to have full-time work. And yeah. until we break those things away, people will not be able to choose the jobs that suit them. Yeah. So there is this business of work design, but there's also the bit of people being able to choose the environments that they're safest in. I have a question here, I think. Yes, that's number one. Go ahead. J just say who you are and hold that nice and high. Hi, I'm Natasha Cooper. I, I work for Linfox. Um, David, my question relates to a point you made earlier about uh, commercialisation. There's many people in this room, and I speak for some of my colleagues who are from healthcare backgrounds. Australia ranks number eight in the world for healthcare innovations and discovery. Yet in terms of commercialisation, we're 29th. Mm. Um, and, and David and Stefan, you might want to interject here, but I'm very curious about what's happening at CSIRO um, yeah. and perhaps in the public services sector to uh, help mend this disparity? Yeah, it's a good question. It's right. something that Stefan and I were actually talking about just before we came up here. We're sort of bemoaning the fact that Australia has this extraordinary history of um, technological development and innovation, and then we can't bloody monetize it. Yeah. Um, I'm actually going to pass to you first, Stefan. We will go to you, David, as well. Everyone That's okay. Panel. So, yeah. okay. I mean, we tend to invent all of the marvelous stuff that goes into the smartphone or the iPhone, but we don't build the act, don't take that next step. So that is that is known, and inside being inside, sorry, that's one of our biggest challenge that we are working on and finding ways to solve. And, you know, the, uh, we've changed a lot. Um, but, yeah, I think um, overall, Australia has a more of a demand side problem than a supply side problem on innovation. So one of your predecessors, David, used to say, if uh, that was uh, Catherine Livingston, used to say, if Australia only knew what Australia knows, right? <laughs> we have awesome <laughs> science research capabilities in so many fields but yeah. I think having looked you know from where I look at it industry doesn't want them as much as they're valuable for they you know a lot of our best AI machine learners are all on flights to Los Angeles and California to work in autom the automotive sector which yeah. is gearing up for automated cars we're not using that mm -hmm. there but that's a, that's happening right across the board I don't know mm -hmm. David what do you think Okay, let me try to address the first one about the why. Why are we not better at commercialisation? I'm going to put to you, I think it's culture. You see, in the US or even in Europe now, if you're a professor you, or in a certain area of doing research, you going into the private sector and start up is just sort of common, just what you do. Here, we've got this demarcation. Somehow, the academic purity of research, it shouldn't be sullied with that horrible commercialisation. And I think it's fundamentally wrong. And it, now, research can do, should create value, and value translates into economic value. So I think that if you look at this collaboration issue in the silo, is part of the reason why we're not getting uh, this commercialization of really great fundamental research and health, in fact, all areas. So I think there is a big issue here. You go to most universities today and ask how many of them worked in the private sector, you'll get maybe 2% of the hands will go up. By the way, private sector's no worse, no better, sorry. Um, they don't go across and work in <laughs> academic work. Look, the other one has been um, one of attitude and also lack of capital in the area. So the sorts of things we're trying to do at CSRO, one is we have a very, you know, so that CSRO does wonderful research. That means the scientists there, I mean, it really is a Australian icon. It's an institution. But we've, we're really having to work hard to say, well, what does this science do? How can it make a difference? It may be commercial or it may be just, you know, value creation in the environment. It may be something else, but what we're going to do with it. So we've got a, a commercialisation or a value creation team, and then we've set up a innovation fund as well that is now about $250 million. So it's all about getting great science off the lab, off the lab uh, bench and into beta. And I think we need to do more of that. There is a big gap at that, um, that level. Uh, and then, you know, whether, look, I'm, I'm not as concerned about people going to the US and uh, getting access to capital there. It's a global market. We're just going to make Australia really attractive to stay here and be part of the global world. And I think there's more people doing that. So I'm involved in setting up an innovation precinct in Sydney around Central and Hopefully we're going to try and attract UTS is involved, Sydney Uni, New South Wales, Chamber of Commerce, City of Sydney. It's really exciting. People are saying, how do we create an environment? 
But we've got to believe in ourselves along the way. There. So that's sort of my... <coughs> Diane, do you have a reflection on, on that question, why we don't kick it up to the next commercial level? Look, I spent a couple of weeks in Israel twice over yeah. the last three years because they're not perfect. You know, They're not really inclusive in their innovation ecosystem, but they do it pretty well, certainly compared to us. And a couple of observations about what's different there. So governments make direct investments there. If they see something like mobile eye technology, they will go and really get behind <coughs> it. Um, and why do they do that? They do that because they've got 8.8 .8 million people in that country, and so they know that their domestic market is never going to commercialise something that will be globally mm. successful. So they stand around that country and they look mm. outwards. Now, That's of course, true. there's another good reason for looking outwards if you're Israel. Um, but what do we do in Australia? We kid ourselves that we've got 25 million people, so we're a big country, aren't we? You stand around the fringe and we look inside. And we've got to stop doing that because with the globalised economy of today, it doesn't matter if you've got global aspirations or not, but if you don't have globally competitive products, they're not even going to fly in Australia. Yeah. Um, and so I think there is that inward nature that is one of the real problems. Which takes us to um, a conversation, I think, here, and we'll come to other questions, of course, throughout the, this uh, conversation this morning. But an area that was actually touched on, um, if not specifically, then tangentially by all of you, and it, and it comes from this conversation about how we think about ourselves and our, our work and what we create and why we do it, is that concept of, um, I think you used the phrase really well, David, which was the idea of a, a culture-driven purpose-led mm. business, mm. where you know what you're there to do, yeah. you know, the, the why, what, why am I here, what am I here to do, yeah. and that the culture around that is uh, clear and mm. sound and productive. Um, mm. Can you describe that, not necessarily idealised, but maybe even current, you know, purpose-led, culture-driven workplace ethos, what it looks like? Um, what it produces, probably, what it makes? Well, I, I, I know what it produces, I don't know if I can describe it, but I mean, in a changing world, um, look, you know, markets will change, competitors will change, <laughs> governments will change. Um, so you need to know what you stand for and, and you need to define what value you create, not the product you necessarily manufacture. Right. It's about, so if I'm, t if I'm a, you say Telstra, you could call yourself a telecommunications company, but if, it, if Telstra had thought of themselves as a communications company, they might have invented WhatsApp, for example. So it actually changes the way you think about what you do. Mm. Um, if we thought of CSIRO as purely a science company, um, we may lose enormous opportunities about, you know, research that we do, um, other applications to society. So looking at what your purpose is, is really important because it opens your mind to other possibilities about meeting the needs of a customer or citizen or whatever so that's what in I'm my work what's given us purpose most often is is the problem we're trying to solve a problem and we really focus on that so there's some of the you know the wing tips at the, the tip up at the end of the wings on planes save Boeing a massive amount of fuel they're our biggest customer and we discovered uh, discovered that we discovered the three-dimensional avoidance systems that they use in the air right. Uh, the sorts of stuff we've seen about the dilemmas of the aged care sector last night on Four Corners. So, you know, this is a huge challenge, but there are CSIRO teams working through all of the technologies that allow you to stay at home for longer with monitoring and reporting. And inside the organisation, you know, when we have a problem that's our raison d'etre, we use all our science and ability to solve it. And sometimes, you know, we're looking at stars as we did in astronomy 20 years ago, and that, or 30 years ago, and that eventually translates to Wi-Fi for a lot of different things, it's the true. Fast Fourier album, it's so we were solving something else. But when you tackle a complex, hard to solve science problem, you know, it almost always leads to something good. And that's, that's for my view of how the purpose question is, is resolved, is where it gets real, is where we have a problem where if we know we fix it, we yep. make things better for someone. And, and would you describe CSIRO in that way, in, the, in terms That's how I would view it. It's a problem-solving culture. And, and, it's, it's, but that's my view. I don't know. I mean, that's... And you've got your purpose down. Yeah. Once you know you're part of a team working on solving a big science challenge or problem and you can make sense of why that's useful, you follow it. and. It's a beautiful thing when it works, and that's yeah. that's what leads to all the other serendipitous discoveries. Well, okay. Part of it, anyway. Uh, look, let me be a bit more nuts and bolts. 
Anybody in this room been to Bunnings lately? Yeah. Yep. Okay, right. <laughs> Every weekend. So Bunnings is a <laughs> world-class DIY retailer. Um, it is one of the most profitable of its type globally, if not the most profitable. But when you look at some of its numbers, you see that its stock and inventory levels are really high. You know, and so people look and go, oh, Bunnings should be doing something about this, it's not well managed, la, la, la. So what's Bunnings' purpose? Bunnings' purpose is to be there in Australian neighbourhoods to allow people to renovate their homes and to do projects at home. And they recognise that most of us still work Monday to Friday, so we do those projects on the weekend. So when you go to Bunnings, it's a bloody disaster if all the stuff you want for that project is not is there. Not there. there. <laughs> so what does that drive you to? It drives you to keep higher stock levels. So it's always there. I think purpose that way, it's very clear to the people that design the supply chain all the way through Bunnings and then the people that are there interacting with the people that are coming in to buy the stuff with mm. the customers, just exactly what they're there for and what their purpose is to make that bit of Australian life easier and cheap. So whereas on paper that might look like a poor business model, mm. um, change your thinking and it actually is the one that, that should Great apply thing. in this yeah. circumstance. And that's how purpose yeah. leads you yeah. to these sorts of decisions that are good for the business and good for the customer. Plus you have those little trolleys the kids can use. They're, <laughs> They're good, aren't they? <laughs> and they have a sausage sizzle out yes, the front. Yes, that's right. That's, that's right. the reason I go to one. Um, I think we had one here. Is there a microphone here? There you go. Hi, it's Sarah Clemens here from the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, and it's not a question I think that can be answered, but I just would like your thoughts. They're the best questions of all. <laughs> well, this morning I woke up to the news on the ABC that um, you know China is doing wonderful things in in um, technology and AI by yeah. fitting their citizens with um, with chips or whatever it was that they were doing and monitoring their behaviours so they can either be rewarded or punished. Or punished. Now, what a story. It was a most remarkable story. If you missed it, go on the ABC website. You talk about the bloody future being terrifying, my God. Yes. So, I mean, like, how do we embrace um, technology and artificial intelligence, which is a wonderful thing that is helping us move into the future, but also protect us as citizens and workers from the stresses of having that kind of scrutiny and and the ramifications of Well, such I can't speak for now. Tim, but Tim, I guess you, you went there and suggesting get involved. Yeah, absolutely. This is, it, it's a really good example of um, why it isn't just a technological issue. The technology can do all this stuff, but the, whether it's a positive or a negative thing, ultimately, it depends on the social system that it's embedded in. In China, it's an authoritarian system, so they almost naturally go to using the technology for that way because it gives them control over the population. Our government probably has, you know, given half a chance, similar intentions. There's, and, and even though we tend to do it in, um, you know, particular populations within the bigger population, so monitoring um, people receiving welfare payments, et cetera, et cetera. And we do use the technology in, the, in, those, in those respects. And we do it really badly in those respects as the, um, you know, the recent example with um, uh, where they use data matching between taxation returns and welfare recipients um, and then decided that there were X number of people who had paid, been overpaid on their welfare and then were sent bills, you know, huge bills for repayment of money. And, and then, even then, so, I mean, that's just bad use of data. It's a surveillance method, obviously, um, and it caused people a lot of grief and um, hardship. But <clears throat> the other aspect of it was when some people did actually push back, there was a particular um, Brisbane-based freelance journalist who wrote a story about all of this stuff using her experience um, with, uh, uh, with the department. Um, the government then interpreted that as an attack on them and under the legislation, the legislation allows the government to respond to that attack by releasing personal data. So they leaked her personal data mm -hmm. to another journalist at the Canberra Times who wrote a story about her. So, you know, we're so kind of Mayor, doing... Mayor de Blasio from New York City has introduced an algorithmic impact assessment task force, which has to look... All algorithms used in New York City have to pass criteria of transparency, fairness, 
equity, I can't remember what the ethics. other ones are. Ethics, yeah, exactly. Right. So I think, you know, the Uber caught a soft guard in a regulatory sense around the taxi industry. It was legal some places, yeah. not legal others, didn't know what to do with it. That's just the beginning of stuff that AI is yeah. about to give us. So we're writing the report right now. We're writing, I've seen the, the, the structure of the ethics framework we're writing and it's listing item after item that is sort of unresolved ethical dilemma that we want to wake up the nation to. And this is, as you say, it's a national discussion we need to we, drive. We have to be prepared to prioritise taking some of the resource and time that's freed up from automation into this end of the equation, which is thinking about how we set up the frameworks properly and then having enough regulators and people who are hindsighting it to make sure you know, that we don't have enough. AI, AI won't work from us until we But it's our choice on priority. Yeah, I, I, look, I, I'd agree. Um, I mean, just to give you some sense of it, uh, the CSRO board has an ethics review committee because so much of the science, I mean, all science is incredible, but it can be used for good or bad, and just like technology. So you need to be very vigilant. Into, so uh, genetic and engineering, you know, um, uh, sequencing of the genome, human genome, I mean, it, it potentially could save a lot of lives, it could do a lot of harm as well if it's used badly. So I do think there's a real responsibility on governments and leaders uh, to step in and work this thing through. Um, but also, there's a, I, I just, to your point, Tim, we've got to have people who have to take responsibility for their own lives as well. Sure. And so you can't, I don't think, you know, uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. I mean, so we need integrity with individuals too. Mm. I mean, if you're receiving a, a welfare payment, but ripping the system off over here, I, I don't think that's what we want in our society. No, we now, don't, but it's I, a pretty small problem. Yeah, if, if I, I understand. It, but, as, as it was shown to But there yeah, needs yeah. to be res individual responsibility sure. as well. So, um, so I just think we need to get the balance yeah. right. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I've got plenty here um, via the app. Our digital delegates are very hard working. Put your hand up if you've got a question in the room. I'm looking right up the back. I can see if your hand's up, I'm sure. Any at the moment? No? Yell out if I'm ignoring you. Um, I'll come to this in a moment, but on, on that discussion, it's a really good question about you know, where that can go badly rather than working for us. Um, a, a long time ago um, at New York University, I was taught by the then, now late, um, technology uh, uh, skeptic, Neil Postman, um, and who always used to pose, I think, is still a very interesting and probably even more relevant question now when confronted by new technology, which is, what problem does it solve? Mm. Meaning, I guess, if it ain't broke, why are you trying to fix it? Um, what problem does it solve? I is that a question that we've stopped asking? Is it a question that doesn't need to be asked anymore? Central to my questioning that in you know, my whole CSIRO career has been what problem are we solving? Yeah. Um, automated vehicles, the number of people that get killed and maimed and really badly injured this week on Australian roads, the most dangerous part of the car is a human driver. We have the opportunity to automate that out and across the workforce. Um, antimicrobial drug resistance, bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, we will use AI to find the next uh, antibiotics, um, domestic violence, there are ways intelligent, sensitive, ethical use of data could actually help us address that problem in society. All, so many different things we can look at are able, the problems that can be solved by AI. But as David said, we've got to be vigilant around the ethics. I, I think it's a really important question, but it's not the only question. You see, I'm not suggesting it's the only yeah, one, but I'm no, wondering no. if it's one that's been It's a look. threshold question. Well, yeah, well, because, because, like, because we assume yeah. that if we're making it new, it must by definition be useful and good. And maybe yeah. it's not always. Why no, do so many startups all. fail? I'd agree. Because yeah, well. they're not solving a problem. Yeah. yeah. Well, so and voting is a perfect example of that. Yeah. Yeah. In using electronic machines for voting is just um, an invitation to ruin your democracy, basically. A pencil and paper is right. a much more effective system. You look like you disagree well, with that, with that well, David. Well, I just think that, I mean, well, I, I just want to put a, an alternative perspective, because I, I don't know if I agree or disagree. It's like pure science, quantum physics. What the hell does that have to do with life? I mean, quantum physics is fascinating for, the, for a quantum physicist, um, looking at how qubits behave. And if you go back 20 years, you know, there was, it was just, just the joy of discovery actually to work it out. Sure. Now, as it turns out, it's had an incredible impact yeah. uh, in many ways. So I just think that so not my, every... My dad, I'm going to tell on you to Michelle sorry. Simmons. Uh, no, 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 I like ahead, Michelle Simmons. I, we all like but, Michelle But sometimes Simmons. there is the joy of learning and the joy uh, yeah. of discovery and, 
that we don't know where it will go. Of course. I love that and point. That's, so yeah. My dad um, is a was a physicist and he did work on travelling ionospheric disturbances. He related solar flares on the sun to disturbances in the Earth's ionosphere, right. which we now use to operate the square kilometre array that CSIRO has built in that's the right. desert, right? Because it has to go through the ionosphere to do it. He didn't know then, anything yeah. about the square kilometre yeah. array But isn't when he that a that. core problem that's been solved? And it was, the problem so, that we don't yeah. know enough So when I talk yet, about problem solving, will. it's well, not necessarily... Isn't that what CSIRO is helping yeah. on? It's, that's it exactly right. It's going into disarray. I'm trying to get everyone to agree. I told, Sorry. I told yeah. them they could all talk about <laughs> you. Did, you did. Um, <laughs> I've got a great question here as we um, come to the end of our discussion. I can't believe it's raced away like that. But th this, this brings us right back to fundamentals, I guess, where we really live in this, in this room. And thank you for this question. Given the changes in work that we need to navigate, what priority skills, what or which priority skills should we be developing in our organisation's future leaders? And maybe not even leaders, but maybe just workforce as well. Which priority skills? I'll go, I'll go around the bench, Diane. Human interaction, working with people. That's it. Yeah, I, I, I think there's the people skills. I do think that good analytical um, logic is really important in, in leadership and inclusion, which is sort of the human skills. I'm going to pick you up on inclusion, and, and we will get yeah, to, the, to answer yeah. that, but just a sub-question, yeah. um, and I guess it picks up on your point as well. Yeah. We're hearing a lot more now, and I think it's a good thing, about the potential in the future of a more neurodiverse mm. workforce. Mm. Um, given Diane has identified good, you know, EQ, which mm. not all neuro, neuro, uh, neurodiverse people have, mm. but you've mentioned inclusion. Mm. Square that circle for me, can you? Not sure I can, but I, I because I think that um, you, the human interactions, the, the inclusive behaviour, I mean, what, what you realise with the flow of information, no one person has the answers to everything. You need a diverse set of people around you, and you need to be open and willing to accept those ideas to get to the best possible outcome. And that different way of being. And, and yeah. different way of being. Thank and, you for pushing us, because I yeah. think what you're saying and is we need to redefine diversity. Yeah. Diversity is no longer demographic. No. Yeah. Diversity yeah. is about what in here yeah. with what we've yeah. learnt to yeah. do allows us to do certain things yeah. within um, the workplace. So if you look at Oricon, Guillaume Suegas has defined the eight archetypes of the bits of work that need to be done and everyone's got a coffee mug on their main archetype and you can't have a meeting if you haven't got each coffee mug in the room, <laughs> which is a really clever way to do it's it. Just, yeah, it's it, you an know, accountable yeah. way. So it's yeah. a very accountable yeah. way, but it, ma it makes a different sort of diversity. Yeah, yeah. 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 but, I'm, but I'm at, at the, the core, idea. who are the yeah. people that Sure. De design that Did system. Did you want to finish off that point, so, David? Um, I no, I think, I think, let's go, Tim. Yeah, Tim. Um, yeah, look, I, I agree entirely. I think it's those human-centred soft skills and they arise um, and function better in a diverse work environment so that you're getting more different sorts of input. Should we call them soft skills, though? Yeah, I know. It's, soft a, it's a really sort of problematic. Soft. Yeah. Soft. Yeah. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's... It's a very, they're difficult skills, engaging people, getting the best out of people, giving them a future, giving them a hope. Carbon they're difficult. skills. Hmm? Yeah, they're Carbon skills. Yeah. Carbon, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and we need a little bit of technology. Yeah. Too. I will go, look, yeah. so we need to play Connect Four more. Um, we also talked about that. We, played, oh, we oh, talked oh, about peace. Connect Four, <laughs> but it causes you to, forces you to think about future possibilities to win the game of Connect Four. So this is a... a Again. And I think anticipatory governance gets important for our leaders. The ability to anticipate what lies ahead and take oh, earlier action that. on it. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're, we're moving into to a better world. The other thing is ecosystems and networks and understanding how you plug into this bigger picture is, is changing. I do think technology changes how we interrelate with blockchain yeah. has taught us this. Blockchain is you know, a distributed system that is completely new. Yeah. Um, we have a minute left, and so I'll, I'll jump right ahead to the very end of our working life, if I can, and pick up um, a point that David made about the idea of retirement being a misnomer and get rid of that term. Um, let's say we're getting rid of that term um, and that one's lived experience is just going to grow and change and shift and move away from a 12-hour day to something else. Um, can we redefine what that end of life working living experience might be, David, if we're not calling it retirement? Well, I mean, look, if we're going to live longer, which I think we all are, and I think, you know, the, our you know, the contribution back into society, be it paid work or 
contributed community work is really important. Mm. And when I, I mean, you watched that program of Four Corners last night, you know, it's just the debilitation, the, the loss of great individuals who can contribute back into our society yeah. in some way. Absolutely. We need to care and, and, and create opportunities for that. That's what I see. So mm -hmm. I don't like the term retirement. It implies you retire from something and you go and you're no longer relevant. That's just fundamentally wrong. Uh, we need a richness in our well, people of all ages, and that's what we need to do. So that was what I was trying to make. We yeah. start that section of our report. Australia's ageing population is an asset. It's an underutilised yeah, asset. asset. You know, we need tapered retirement models. You can't do the same sort of work. The, the studies show with the right connection to the workforce, you have better mental and physical health later in life, yeah. and you should continue on all the way through. But you, know, we, you can't still be down the coal mine digging coal at age 70. That's not good. To, but you can be on the surface training the next generation yeah. how to do it more safely or writing a thesis on some aspect of what you've learned. We are underutilising this massive resource that is in aged care homes right now that could be more productively used. In Sweden, I read about this experiment of putting the aged care facility next to the university so the kids could go in there and yeah. learn from all these smart right, people. Exactly. And, right. You know, there's so many better That's options. Right. It was devastating watching the Four Corners thing uh, last night. We can do was. so much better. But you know what? I, I started off anxious and I'm feeling a whole lot better with the way that you finished it. Can you please thank our magnificent panel this afternoon?